welcome to State Bar of Michigan's On Balance Podcast, where we talk about practice management and lawyer wellness for a thriving law practice with your hosts, Joanne Hathaway and Tish Vincent, here on Legal Talk Network. Take it away, ladies. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the State Bar of Michigan's On Balance podcast on Legal Talk Network. I'm Samantha Meinke, sitting in today for your regular hosts, Joanne Hathaway and Tish Vincent. (laughs) Today, we're coming to you live from the State Bar of Michigan's 2018 Next Conference, and I'm very lucky to be joined by the top leadership of the State Bar of Michigan, our Executive Director, Janet Welch, our newly sworn-in President, Jennifer Grieco, and our immediate past President, Donald Rockwell. I'm going to turn the microphone over to these three because they know so much more about leadership than I do, and I want to listen and learn. So take it away. (laughs) Thank you, Sam. I think I'd like to start by asking Don Rockwell, who has just finished his year as president, what advice he would have to give to Jennifer Grieco, who is about to hit the road and go on the local bar circuit and talk to our members. So, Don... You have been touting the works of the bar according to our strategic plan. What would you tell Jennifer the members have to say about what the state bar is doing? And what were the the highlights of of your interaction with the bar? It's uh, been a quick year for me, but nevertheless, it's been one year that I've been at the job of being president. And my thoughts, ironically, have not changed. They're virtually the same as they were 365 days ago. And as you recall, I know Jennifer was awake when she was looking at me when making my speech (laughs) that I made it very simple that uh, my recommendation that we stay the course only because we have so much going on right now. And it, it all stems from our 21st century practice task force, which evolved into our strategic plan, uh, which uh, began, what, uh, a year and a half ago or so, two years ago. Jennifer and I served on the committee to discuss it. We were able to memorialize the uh, thoughts uh, of our 21st Century Practice Task Force and our staff. I mean, Janet's staff has been doing an outstanding job. We have so many oars in the water right now. There's really no reason to change the course, and that's why I say stay the course. So... With that said, I alluded to some of the programs that we have been engaged in, and Jennifer, uh, in her wonderful speech this afternoon, did much the same. I uh, really did, uh, talking about the things that are, have been transpiring here, which we know as leaders uh, because we're involved with it firsthand, but sooner or later, our membership will figure it out, and hopefully they will be impressed as they should be. We are in a changing environment ever more quickly And uh, some of the things that Jennifer alluded to today, I think, uh, touch upon the need to change. Don, as you were traveling around the state talking to members, which programs or initiatives of the state bar did you find required the most explanation to members? It was the uh, limited scope representation issue. Many members, in fact, almost all members didn't hear at all about that. And the ongoing work of our committee to uh, come up with rules and regulations for it. They were not aware of it. I found the most interest in that program when I talked to the Michigan District Judges Association. And if you spend any time in district court, you know you're dealing with pro per litigants. And so anytime a judge can get a lawyer, even on a limited scope appearance, inside the courtroom, it will be of great help to the court. Makes things much more efficient. And it allows, of course, the the attorney to give advice to the clients, which the judge obviously can't do. That I found to be encouraging uh, because I'm hopeful that given my my theme this whole year was access to justice, that the more uh, we can get lawyers involved with people that otherwise would not see a lawyer, and albeit on a limited scope basis, then I'm all for it. I'm absolutely all for it. So that, I think, would be the most surprise I witnessed from our colleagues about that proposal. And many seem to be interested in thinking along those lines. And as uh, I can tell you in my own career, I've never thought in terms of limited scope. 
never have even considered it, even when clients are not paying me anymore, but I, I still feel the duty to finish their legal issue, legal problem in court. But if it was a limited scope representation, the clients certainly are aware of it and fully authorizing the limited scope presentation that I can now do things and let the clients go with a little more knowledge of their pro se, proper appearances in court. But now they have this legal training behind them, which hopefully will help the judge too. So Jennifer, yes. as, as you're about to launch your year, of all the programs and initiatives of the State Bar, which ones are you most excited to be talking about? Well, I'm certainly excited to be talking about the Professionalism and Practice Summit that's coming up on October 18th. Professionalism was, was before this program was even in place, something that was really important to me and something I wanted to stress as the president of the bar because what we are seeing in society is, is that our citizens cannot even have a civil conversation with, with people that don't, they don't agree with, that don't agree with them. We're seeing bullying at all levels in society. And we as lawyers, as professionals, civility is the hallmark of our profession. And we can't have the a lack of civility that we're seeing in society also infringe and impact even more the profession than it already has. And in fact, it's time for us to be leaders in society and people come to us because they are in a dispute or they do need the assistance. And so it's time for us to step up and treat the opposing counsel as an officer of the court with the respect that we all know each one of us is, is due so that we can resolve our problems. We don't, citizens don't need to have a bunch of lawyers fighting each other. They can fight without us. What we need to do is come to resolutions. And in order to do that, you've got to be civil. So I'm, I'm excited for the program. Program. I think that we need to be working with our bench. We need to be working with the local bar associations in order to make change. I mean, we can talk about this problem all we want. Uh, if we don't get ahead of it soon, the lack of civility is just going to get worse in society. And we've got a new group of lawyers, a new group of law students, that this is what they're seeing every day on TV. This is what's going on in the news. And that's not the way of this profession. So we need to get a hold of this problem now. Uh, obviously, the bench needs to be involved in uh, whether it's sanctions or reprimands, but we all need to work together at this point in time. Uh, even before I started in this role as president, I was reaching out with the president of the Oakland County Bar Association, Jim Parks, and we've already started having discussions with the chief judge in Oakland County because we really need to figure out how can we solve this problem before it gets worse. I totally agree with Jennifer. And it's been an ongoing problem as long as I've been a lawyer, which is excess of 40 years now. But part of the problem, I think, in what we are going to be dealing with is that the client expectation is that they want their lawyer to have this pit bull mentality both in and out of court. And so the lawyers are not unaware of that. And so they recognize they have to appeal to a certain type of client. And in order to do that, they have to look like pit bulls all the time which obviously doesn't do anyone any good whatsoever, certainly not the client, ironically, and certainly not the court. So how do we educate the public that good lawyering and civility is good business and good for them? If we could remove several lawyer-based shows, TV shows, that with Hollywood highlighting this pit bull mentality, that would be a large step. We can't do that, obviously. And Jennifer, I think, hit it. We really need to educate our lawyers and recognize that we're professionals first and that we have the public to serve, not their own personality inclinations and certainly not their unreasonable expectations of their clients. I also think that all um, lawyers can come up with examples of how the lack of civility and professionalism in a case caused the client to spend more money. Yeah. I mean, there are concrete examples of this dispute did not need to happen. This dispute did not result in any improvement in your case, but it cost you this motion, these hearings, these issues, $20,000, $30,000. You put concrete numbers on what just being a jerk to opposing counsel cost you in the case, that makes a difference. That's showing you, you want to litigate. Everybody wants to litigate their cases cheaper, quicker, more efficiently. Lack of civility only causes more cost, more time, and more inefficiency. So you want to get to a resolution. You want to get out of out of this lawsuit. You don't want to spend money on attorneys. Um, and we hear that all the time. Then, then allow us to do our job and be efficient. So Jennifer, you talked about 
working with local bar associations to promote initiatives of the bar. I'm wondering if there's an opportunity, because collaboration is an essential element of our strategic plan, for us to be thinking about, say, collaborating with local chambers of commerce to spread the word about civility being a good practice for lawyers to have. Absolutely. The business community is the one that we really need to reach out to. You know, I'm a a member of the Negligence Council on that as plaintiff and defense lawyers who are very civil towards each other the majority of the time, at least on the section. But there are also lawyers that work with each other on cases time in and time out. They work uh, together on cases, and so they want to have that good relationship. Probably one of the worst areas is commercial litigation, which I work in, and you'd have opposing counsel who you don't see as often, and it's the corporate dollar that is driving driving how they respond in litigation. And so really getting to the business client and through the chambers of commerce to say, this is costing you more money. It is not effective. It's not efficient. It's not the result you really want. I think it's a great idea. I couldn't agree more, but I will speak in my neck of the state of Michigan that it is the domestic relations disputes that uh, we are having the most problems with civility. And again, it goes back to client expectation. The emotions are so high when, uh, for example, when a couple is divorcing and it's not a matter of what's fair, what is equitable, but rather it's a matter of getting a piece of flesh or getting some some kind of uh, another emotional response from the other side. And it is totally unproductive. We've had judges in my area of Michigan where the judges will have the litigants go into chambers without the attorneys. And the judge will then tell the clients that you're, you're just costing the system and you're costing yourselves with this approach to your uh, domestic relations matter. Of course, we have an alternative dispute resolution section that has been preaching the importance of civility and mediation and effective non-adversarial um, methods of resolving disputes. Excellent point. I do serve as a mediator quite often. And I find it fascinating at the outset of the mediation process, the litigants are very emotional and they're very confrontational. But when the process continues, there's almost a catharsis where now the litigants have been able to say what they've wanted to say in the presence of the other opposing party. And now they've had their quote day in court, in quote, and the emotional level is tangibly reduced because of that. And that's a, well, that's a very good point. ADR, I think, especially mediation, when the parties are actually in the same room uh, looking at each other, and I have found uh, great results without having to go to court and get you to get resolution, which uh, to me is a lot more efficient and actually it's closer to what I would ever call justice because now both parties can walk away saying, okay, this is what I've agreed to. So Jennifer and Don, Lawyers are notoriously busy working tremendously long hours. How did you find the time for bar work and what was it about working with the bar that inspired you to find the time to serve in the way that you have? Well, when I first came to Michigan, because I did not live here um, and didn't go to school here, I joined the bar and wanted to become active in the bar to meet new lawyers for networking, to uh, develop a a book of business. Even early on, I knew that that's something that I wanted to do. Um, But being active in the bar for me is more than just networking and meeting other lawyers. It's my ability to serve the public and give back And that was the whole reason I went to law school. It's the whole reason why I wanted to be a lawyer was to feel like I was making a difference in community and society. Uh, It's hard to get that feeling on a day-to-day basis as a lawyer. Uh, Some cases at the conclusion, you have that great feeling that you've, you've done well for your client. You can get some good results. You can get maybe a decision. I've had a couple of those that have had an impact. But the day-to-day practice of uh, fighting with dis- uh, with opposing counsel over discovery and working on billable hours and trying to collect your bills, that doesn't do it for me. What does it for me is making a difference and helping those in this in, in society. And you're able to do that collectively on the 
this bigger scale with members of the bar. We're able to look at big picture issues, whether it's indigent defense or access to justice, equality in the, before the courts, and we're able to work together, pool our resources, and really make, make an impact. And so that's sustain, sustained me as a lawyer. Without that, without that ability to give back through the Bar Association, it would be hard to continue the day-to-day -day grind. While I love practicing law, it is a grind and it's a business. And this allows me to feel like I'm being a professional, um, that I'm following and complying with the rules of professional conduct, the preamble that says lawyers should be public citizens. Uh, so that's, that's why I'm a member and, and have been active in the bar because I get so much out of it myself. Janet, you ask a great question. I'm not sure I have a great answer to it. Uh, you're asking really what has motivated me to volunteer my time. Certainly, I volunteered uh, much of my time in a bar setting, both at uh, my local level and at the state bar level. But I've also found that the lawyers that I see also volunteer their time, they do it beyond a bar. They do it beyond our profession. They volunteer their time in nonprofit settings. And why do they do that? It's that giving back, I think, that Jennifer is alluding to. It, it, it really is. We are blessed to be professionals in a tremendous profession because we help people. And it's the best of professions because of that. But you can help people beyond being a lawyer and being a volunteer uh, in, a, in a leadership role as a lawyer. You can also do it in a charitable, nonprofit community as well. Now, what has motivated me? Uh, networking is one thing that uh, Jennifer talked about. I certainly preach that to young lawyers. I tell them the best thing they can do in their young careers is to meet other lawyers and what better way to do it than be active in your local bar with other volunteering lawyers who are the best of the lawyers. There's a certain irony here. It's always the busiest lawyers that volunteer their time. It's the other lawyers that are struggling that don't, perhaps a full load of clients, they don't seem to want to volunteer their time. Now, why is that? It seems to be almost a, an ironic situation. I don't know why. It's, it's almost a dilemma to me. And I certainly see it at the state level. I look at uh, Jennifer, who has, a, am sure, a huge book of business. I had a huge book of business when I started as a young lawyer. The firm I joined, they just handed me many, many files, and I'm thinking I don't have time to do it. But that didn't detract from my desire to be very active at the local level. And I learned, by the way, from the best of the lawyers that were around my area of the state because I was able to interact with them because they were volunteering their time and they were the best of the lawyers and I'm now in their presence and I'm listening to what they're doing in their practice. It didn't take me long to figure out this is what I want to do, to stay active with the best lawyers. Well, I certainly think that there's a lot, lawyers, we, we give back all the time, but being able to use your law degree in your bar association work or being able to do pro bono work and do something that nobody else can do. Only lawyers can do pro bono. Only lawyers can work on access to justice the way we do. Only lawyers can work on reforming the law and have a better understanding of the law. So if you're not feeling satisfied with your law degree and how you're using your law degree in your day-to-day -day office setting and billing hours and fighting for cases and you know dealing with uh, clients and opposing counsel, you can use your law degree uh, to really help you feel like this has been a worthwhile endeavor and that you're getting a lot from your degree and you're giving back to both the profession and the community. I want to thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Don. I have one last question before I let you go. How can people find you guys online if they want to interact with you and gain some more insight into the knowledge you have? So find me, and I can't believe I'm saying this, at SBM Executive Director on, on Twitter. Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Jennifer underscore Greco, G-R-I-E-C-O. You can also find me on Twitter at DG Rockwell. But you can also go on Google to the State Bar website, and you'll see an email address for me, Donald G. Rockwell. And the email is certainly something that I will respond to. Very good. Thanks again, you guys, for joining us and sharing all of your wisdom and knowledge. We very much appreciate it. That's all the time we have for this program. Thanks, everybody. I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please take a moment to rate us in Apple Podcasts. I'm Samantha Meinke, standing in for Joanne Hathaway and Tish Vincent, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the State Bar of Michigan's On Balance podcast on Legal Talk Network. 
Thank you for listening to the State Bar of Michigan On Balance Podcast. Brought to you by the State Bar of Michigan and produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Find the State Bar of Michigan and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download Legal Talk Network's free app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network or the State Bar of Michigan or their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.